My name is Mike Coleman. I am an evangelist, and Banjot's with me over here, and he's with our product management team. Um, I, uh, I spent the first half of my career as an IT person, but it was a while ago. I was a certified Banyan engineer, so that was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then I, uh, I, uh, I've been at Docker about 14 months. Um, so I spent the first half of my career in IT as an, uh, an architect analyst, and then I, I moved into product management and product marketing on IT sort of related products. So at Docker, my job is to talk um, about Docker from the perspective of operations, right? We've got a lot of uptake and a lot of excitement uh, with developers, but you know, it's now now once you develop an application, you've got to manage it and you've got to deploy it and you've got to monitor it. And so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. I've got um, four four uh, sections that I I'd like to get through. I think we'll probably only get through three, but if we can get through four, great. Uh, the first is just what is Docker to make sure that we all understand sort of what the technology is, how it works. Um, and then we'll talk about specifically um, in your environments, how do you go from a development to a production environment? We call that build, ship, run, um, and show you some management tools there. And then, um, then we'll dive pretty deep into the um, actual engine that runs containers so you can understand about our built-in security, our built-in networking, our built-in orchestration solutions. So I'm really taking, my thought here was to go from high to low. Um, and then we'll back it back out if we have time, and we'll talk about what sort of, sort of the common scenarios how customers use Docker. So in this first section, what is Docker? So Docker is two things, right? Docker is um, arguably one of the most successful open source projects um, in, in recent history. I joined Docker a year ago, um, and Docker images, the things you deploy, are stored on something called Docker Hub. And Docker Hub at that time had just crossed a billion pulls. Um, 12 months later, and so it took two years to get there, roughly. Um, one year later, we're at five billion pulls. So we did five times that in uh, half the time. Um, so it's hugely successful. We have about 2,000 contributors to the project. We have, it's, a, it's actually not one project, it's a bunch of different projects. Um, but it's, it's really um, a great platform that's seeing a lot of uptake. Um, on the other side of that is we are a company. We're Docker Incorporated. So someone you know writes a paycheck for me and, and um, we do a couple of initiatives, which is basically um, we have some commercial products. So we, we develop this uh, containers as a service platform. So let me talk about containers as a service. Um, and that is comprised of a couple of commercial products, which we'll get to. Um, and that is for, op, you know, to bridge the gap between developers and IT operations and do that in a secure, manageable, flexible way. Um, and then we talked about the uh, primary project sponsor, and obviously I need to update my slides because this still says two billion image downloads, and like I said, it's not five million. Um, what, one thing too that we've, we've found is one of the early questions we get when we start having this conversation about, yeah, well, we're a commercial enterprise, and we're selling into the enterprise. People say, like, what percent of people, percentage of people are using Docker in a production? Um, that survey from September is 40%. We have an updated survey that we did ourselves, says it, it's maybe approaching 60%. So somewhere between 40 and 60% of our users are running in production today. Um, and when you, when you um, and earlier this year we went out and we said, you know, what are the things that matter to organizations? Like what are you working on? Um, and, and, you know, 75% of the executives surveyed or the individual surveyed in this, in this survey said, you know, microservices or application evolution or application deployment was a big core issue for them. Um, cloud, you know, that's we at Tech Field Day Cloud. Cloud is a central strategy in DevOps. And Docker sort of sits at the intersection of all three of those initiatives, right? And can, can aid companies and, and speed up those, that work um, uh, for folks. So we're at VMworld. My background is VMware. I spent six years at VMware. Um, when I came to Docker, I remember stopping somebody in a meeting with, with a, another large ISV and saying, well, it's virtualization. I'm like, it's not virtualization. And then everybody's like, it's virtualization. I'm like, it's, it's not virtualization. Um, so my, my mantra for folks, and you know, when we start at the, at the most basic level, we talk about like, what is a container? I tell them containers are not VMs. Right? I've written a whole bunch of blogs on this, whole series, basically. Um, it's a very easy connection to make. right? Uh, coming from VMware, when you tell me that you're going to isolate something and you're going to put it into a, a, a binary unit that you can move around between servers and replicate easily, I'm like, well, that's a, that sounds like a VM. right? The, the difference is that their architectures are very different and the benefits are very different. right? So we'll talk about that a little bit here. So VMs are houses. And what I mean by that is 
that a virtual machine basically is a standalone unit. It's got its own heating, its own plumbing. Um, it's got a front door for security so people can't come in. Uh, you know, and by the same token, there's some things about houses that are unique in that they only get so small. Right? My first house was about 800 square feet, two bedrooms, bathroom, kitchen, a living area. Right? It's about the smallest houses I could find for my young family back in the day. Um, you know, if you think about virtual machines, they get you know, only so small. Certainly you could build pretty small VMs, but most are in the hundreds of megabytes, if not gigabytes of size. Right? Um, they, uh, they are monolithic in the sense that they have their own isolated copy of the operating system with their own isolated CPU and kernel, and it's all contained within those, those four walls of the VM. Containers, on the other hand, are apartments and apartment buildings, right? So an apartment building is the Docker host. And a Docker host is Linux today, Windows with Server 2016, and it runs a piece of software called the Docker Engine, right? And think of the Docker Engine sort of as your doorman, right? Your Docker Engine can tell you how to get to certain apartments, and tell you how to like, you know, he can help you, uh, you know, manage sort of getting in and around and, and, and get moved in and all those things. The Docker, uh, the reason we look at, I consider containers to be apartments is because they share a lot of infrastructure. They share the kernel, right? Just like they share the heating and plumbing of an apartment. And apartments can vary in size greatly. My son uh, just moved into his very first apartment and it is about 140 square feet of luxurious living with uh, you know, a tiny kitchen and a bathroom and a living area. Uh, compare and contrast that to you know, penthouse suites in, in a major metropolitan area, and that's sort of what containers are. Like, we build a lot of our official Docker images off of an Alpine base layer, and that OS layer is about five and a half megabytes of size. I have a Flask-based app that I'll use in a demo, and that full application is 65 megs. But we also have customers who take Docker and put VMs or form, formerly uh, workloads that were formerly running in VMs and are gigabytes in size and they'll put them in a container. So containers can be very tiny to very large, right? So just like apartment buildings can run that route. So again, containers are isolated and secure. They have that front door, um, but they vary in size and uh, there's a couple other differences, but those are the big ones, right? So sum it up, shared resources, lighter weight. Um, instantiation times is a big deal. Um, uh, containers fire up in about three-eighths of a second because what's really happening when you start a container is you are starting a Linux process. You're not booting an operating system. So when that container starts, it's literally just like launch the process and go. Uh, virtual machines, of course, uh, they can take several minutes to boot depending on what they're doing because they're booting the, the full OS. Um, containers do not use a hypervisor. They are, as I said before, they're a Linux process. So whatever, you know, they go directly to the hardware. There's no translation. There's no um, routing through multiple layers depending on, on what action you're taking against the operating system. And I'm almost going to take this last bullet out, but I still leave it in there. Um, when I joined Docker, uh, it was sort of like there was this ideological purity around like, oh, if you're doing containers, you're doing microservices or you're on your way to microservices. And as I mentioned before, what we're seeing is a lot more customers uh, getting into the idea of like, well, I want the benefits of the portability of Docker containers or um, some other benefits. So we're, we're going to place these monolithic applications into a container and they're going to stay there. That's where they're going to live. Um, so that's sort of the, the breakdown. Now, they're different, but they're not, they're not mutually exclusive, right? So just because they're not the same thing doesn't mean that you don't use them together. Ma matter of fact, most customers um, do something like we see on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, right? So we'll start on the left, though. The left basically is a physical server. And as I said before, right, a, a Docker host is basically a physical server uh, or, a vir uh, or, uh, or a virtual server. Well, in this case, physical server on this side um, has some operating system, some Linux operating system. This physical server could be a Raspberry Pi, or it could be a UCS, right? It could be anything that can run a modern Linux kernel. Um, and then with Windows Server 2016, of course, Windows Server containers would be able to be, it could be a Windows Server 2016 as the operating system. We add in the Docker engine, which is a very lightweight executable, and from there you can instantiate containers. Or you could move to the right. You could take that operating system, put it in a VM, load the Docker engine, and run containers inside of that VM. And so, you know, we talk to customers who maybe they use one version of Linux in their testing environments and they use another version in their production environments. And then, of course, side by side, you can just have a normal VM running sort of a, a standalone application as you've always had before. Um, so why do people choose one over the other? 
Hypervisors today offer a lot of great features around uh, vMotion, dynamic rescheduling, HA, high availability. There's a lot of existing um, expertise and workloads that have been, or uh, uh, workflows that have been built around vSphere, and that's where people are comfortable. That's the workload they want to deploy. Um, and then the other one is, is capacity utilization and, and um, homogeneity of the, of the workload. So if you can't drive, if you don't have enough workload to drive capacity utilization on a server, then you might go with hypervisor, right? Because otherwise you're going to go back to that world before VMware where you had underutilized servers. So I don't want to take and say, okay, well, throw your container up on a physical server and load it to 30%. That just doesn't make sense. That's like going backwards. Um, is there any overhead for having the hypervisor in between? Uh, yeah, there is, actually. And there's a really good white paper um, that HPE just did where they basically took, and they didn't use vSphere, they used KVM, but they did KVM against bare metal containers. So they did sort of, um, and they, they showed like what's the, they put containers running natively and they put VMs running natively. They ran about six different benchmarks. And depending on the benchmark, there's a very significant um, performance gain with containers to a minimal, but every one of those benchmarks showed a performance gain going native with containers and not putting them in a VM. And that, you know, that's a great question because it actually leads to, well, what are the reasons that some people go native on physical? Mm. And one of the big ones is around performance. Is it be because the inter-container communication, so TCP IP level, that kind of stuff, or is it more context uh, switching uh, on the CPU level. It's actually both. It's there's a number of different factors. Um, one is just the going down through the device drivers into the hypervisor and then back out to the storage and coming back out. And there's a, multiple translations that happen. Say so where they saw some of the better gains was around like some very storage intensive um, applications. In other cases, it's just the fact that you've got more stuff running, right? You've got multiple instances of operating system services, so there's more over. There's just more overhead. There's more work. At the very low end, they saw like a two percent overhead, and then the up, other ones were upwards of thirty or forty or fifty percent, depending on the benchmark. Again, these are you know your mileage may vary. You're gonna you're gonna need to test your applications to see where it lands in that that world. But if you've got a very a performance sensitive application, um, people often go to bare metal for that regard. Um, and and it reduces complexity, right? If you're, you're only managing it one layer then. So if you can fill up a physical server, if you do have that capacity, um, you know, that's some of the reasons that people go there.